greetings in Jesus name. Today is a very special healing service focusing on the compassionate Good Shepherd. Healing is about loving our neighbors as we pour healing oil on their wounds. How many of you remember Mr. Rogers on TV? Remember, he would say, Won't you be my neighbor? He was actually a pastor, and so he was echoing Jesus' message, Who is my neighbor? Do you have any wounded neighbors that might need a healing touch from Jesus, the great physician? COVID times has left many of our neighbors with great wounds, not just physical, but also the wounds of depression, anxiety, loneliness, isolation from loved ones, the, the pain of not being able to go to the hospital when our loved ones are sick, the pain of not being able to attend funeral or other family events. Every year at All Saints, we take part in the Good Samaritan story through Samaritan's Purse. Operation Christmas Child, that amazing parable since 1993. It's inspired a hundred and 60 million Operation Christmas Child boxes. Isn't that remarkable? In BC, since 1996, we have a law called the Good Samaritan Law. It protects ordinary people from being sued when helping others in an emergency. Do we want Good Samaritans to be sued? The Good Samaritan image has become synonymous with helping people around the world. There are Good Samaritan hospitals. There are Good Samaritan travel agencies. Good Samaritan is a synonym, synonym for being helpful. Now, if you learned a Good Samaritan parable in Sunday school, raise your hand right now. How old were you when you first learned that parable? I've been asking people, both church people and unchurch people, what do they know about the parable of the Good Samaritan? And it's amazing. Even uh, atheists that I've talked to remember the parable of the Good Samaritan. One person I talked to, he said, no, he'd never heard of it. And then I told him the story, and he suddenly remembered it from Sunday school. I'm wondering about uh, younger children nowadays. Many have never been to Sunday school. If they still know this amazing story, I 
really appreciate Sunday School and the work that our All Saints people put into it. But there's a danger in Sunday School. The danger is when you get older, you think you've already got it all figured out, so you don't need to think about it. The Good Samaritan story, it can uh, breed sort of contempt or mindlessness. Our mind can switch off because we, I, I remember that from Sunday school. But this world's best known story is perhaps the most misunderstood of any of Jesus' parables. Many sort of instinctively think the parable is merely about being nicer to our neighbors. End of discussion. Very few people, except our bishop, Peter Klenner, I talked to, see it as a healing parable written by a Christian doctor who is fascinated with the healing ministry. Some of uh, you may have heard of the Order of St. Luke, the physician, my late father-in-law, Reverend David Klein. He was the warden for the Order of St. Luke in B.C. and Yukon. The Order of St. Luke has been very helpful in helping Christians remember that the healing ministry is central to the gospel. And it's not just for priests or bishops. As John Wimber uh, put it so wonderfully, everybody gets to play. We can all pray for the sick. Now, what do we know about Dr. Luke, the physician? I've been teaching in a three-part series on Luke chapter 10, focusing on the healing ministry. He wrote an amazing 27% of the New Testament, more than any other New Testament. He was the only gospel writer who did a sequel, the book of Acts, addressed to beloved Theophilus. Many people think a middle-level Roman official. Uh, according to the early church historian Eusebius, Dr. Luke was born in Antioch, Syria. Not exactly a safe place to visit nowadays. Dr. Luke was most likely a gentle, if not a Hellenized Jew. That would make him rather unique among the New Testament writers, most of whom were Jewish. Dr. Luke, he traveled with the Apostle Paul in his second and third missionary trip. And that's the reason he could accurately write the book of Acts. How would you like to not have the book of Acts? There'd be so much missing. Dr. Uh, Luke was very loyal. Remember, everyone else deserted uh, Paul. And in 2 Timothy 4, 11, Paul movingly records, only Luke is with me. If everybody else deserts you, it's good to have a doctor with you. 
Dr. Luke was an amazing person. It is not a coincidence that only Dr. Luke, the physician, is the only one of the four gospel writers to include this amazing parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke. Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, Paul refers it to him as a beloved, a dearly loved physician. The Greek word physician means the one who heals. Dr. Luke in his gospel included 20 healing miracles including six that no other gospel writer listed. He also, being a physician, uniquely included many technical Greek medical terms such as hydropicos for dropsy in Luke 14.2 and sphudron for ankle bone in Acts chapter 3, verse 7, Dr. Luke used more medical terms than even Dr. Hippocrates himself, the father of medicine. Only Dr. Luke included the famous phrase, physician, heal thyself. When Jesus approached the sick, Dr. Luke uniquely used medical terms describing a doctor's visit with his patient. No other gospel writer used this medical terminology. Dr. Luke was a first-class scientist, historian, physician, and even poet. Dr. Luke was very human. He wasn't flawless. Dr. Luke, just like modern school teachers, real estate agents, or trade union plumbers, he was very protective of the reputation of his fellow physicians. Did you notice how in Luke 8, while well, telling the very same story about the hemorrhaging woman, Dr. Luke intentionally omitted Mark's comment. Remember, Mark said the woman suffered much under many physicians for 12 years, growing worse, not better, spending all she had on doctors. All I can say is, thank God for MSP coverage in Canada. Dr. Luke, uh, like many medical people, I know was very compassionate. You can imagine he had a good bedside manner. He was very compassionate for outcasts like the Samaritan people. Only Dr. Luke told us about that Samaritan leper who came back in Luke 17 to thank Jesus. Dr. Luke also tells us in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that the Holy Spirit would give us power to witness in Samaria among other places. In Acts chapter 8, Luke tells us that revival broke out in Samaria as Philip preached and healed the sick. And then he tells us Peter and John joined this Samaritan 
revival, praying for many Samaritans to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look at verse 25. In verse 25, a legal expert asked Jesus, What must I do to inherit eternal life? A good question. But the wrong motivation. He didn't want an answer. He just wanted to stump Jesus, just like in the TV game shows Jeopardy or Wheel of Fortune. But you may have noticed Jesus loved to answer questions with other questions. And here he asks two questions for one question. Redirecting the lawyer back to the Bible. Jesus was always redirecting people uh, back to the scriptures. The lawyer already knew the standard answer. He rattled it off without hesitation. Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18. Love God, love your neighbors. And I secretly think that he knew this because he'd been listening to Bishop Peter's sermons on our core values and all saints on the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. What do you think? So Jesus responded to the lawyer, basically said, good for you, but then he started squirming. And in verse 29, Dr. Luke includes the phrase, seeking to justify himself. So he wanted to be picky about who qualifies as neighbor. And you know, in Jewish culture, if you weren't Jewish, you wouldn't be a neighbor. So this uh, lawyer, he wanted to justify himself. He was full of pride and arrogance. But the parable of the Good Samaritan, it crushes our self-righteousness. We can't justify ourselves. We can't heal ourselves. We need Jesus' healing touch. Dr. Luke, he not only loved healing miracles, he loved Jesus parables. He recorded 23 of Jesus' parables, 18 of which are found in no other gospel. We would be, for example, much poorer if Dr. Luke had not uniquely recorded the beloved parables of the prodigal son, Luke 15, and the Good Samaritan. Many literary critics consider this Good Samaritan parable the greatest story ever told on earth. We, we all know this parable. I hope you're still listening. The problem is familiarity. It causes us to miss how scandalous and deeply <clears throat> offensive this parable is. Why would Jesus choose someone whom the audience hates as the hero of this story? You see, Samaritans were always the villains in Jewish folk stories, not the heroes. You may remember how Jesus in John 8, 47, he was falsely accused of being a demon-possessed Samaritan. A demon-possessed Samaritan. That was not a compliment. Eating with Samaritans was seen by Jewish people as just as defiling as eating pork. It was unthinkable. And so the concept of being a good Samaritan was equally unthinkable. You may remember in Luke chapter 9 how James 
And John wanted to destroy a Samaritan village with fire from heaven after they rejected Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. The Samaritans did not like Jerusalem. No, given the recent political animosity uh, below the border, it would not be far off to rename this parable the parable of the good Republican or the parable of the good Democrat, depending on your political biases. Jesus cheered for the hated person. So where did these hated Samaritans come from? They were located in the middle portion of Israel between Galilee in the north and Judea in the south. Originally, they were kosher Israelis accepted, but there's a history of conflict. In 722 BC, all of northern Israel, including Samaria, was conquered by King Shalmaneser V of Assyria, modern-day Iraq. Much of the population was deported, and then non-Israelis from Babylon settled in northern Israel, intermarrying with the remaining Samaritan women. So you can imagine the conflict. The southern Jews were offended by the religious syncretism of the Samaritans who began worshipping foreign Babylonian gods along with Israeli practices. Part of the mutual animosity between Samaritans and Jews is that the Maccabean Jewish king John Hyrcan destroyed the Samaritan temple in 128 BC. It's never been rebuilt. The Old Testament only directs, directly refers to the Samaritans in 2 Kings 17, 29. Every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made, unquote. Similar to the Sadducees in the temple, the Samaritans only read the first five books of the Bible. Now, because the Samaritans Mount Gerizim, where they had their temple, is in the so-called West Bank, many modern-day Samaritans carry two identity cards for both Israel and Palestine. There's only 800 Samaritans uh, left. There's some outside of Tel Aviv at Halon and the rest at Kiryat Luza at Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim is just south of Nablus called Shechem in the Old Testament and Sychar like John 4 in the New Testament. It was the original capital of the kingdom of Israel. In the early 20th century, they were down to just 140 Samaritans still living. Once, there were over a million Samaritans. For some reason nowadays, there are three times as many male Samaritans being born as female Samaritans. So nowadays, they change their roles. They're bringing in non-Jewish wives from the Ukraine in an effort to 
to stave off extinction. You may or may not know that Samaritans still do animal sacrifice. Samaritans, they pray in both Hebrew and Aramaic, but no other Israelites can understand their accent, perhaps similar to Jordi's speaking English in Newcastle. For those of you who have seen the Chosen TV series, you remember how shocked the disciples were when Jesus visited the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus, he had compassion for the hated Samaritans, and so should we. Let's take a look at verse 30. Dr. Luke talks about the notorious Jericho Road, named after this dangerous road with hairpin turns that drop 3,600 feet in just 20 miles, probably par for the course in the Rockies. Known in the 5th century as the bloody way the Jericho Road was the perfect place for highway robbery. Even in the 19th century, you had to play blood money just to get through alive. No wise person would ever travel alone. So why was it still the, the only route that Jewish people took getting to Jericho? Because Samaria was even more dangerous. So they'd rather take their risk with bandits and Samaritans. I, I was amazed to find out there was 12,000 Jewish priests and Levites living in Jericho, and they would visit Jerusalem along that route on a monthly rotation. Take a look at verse 31 and 32. We see the busy priest and Levite who went famously on the other side. They, they might have thought that this reckless stranger got exactly what he deserved. Bad things happen to bad people, sort of like Hindu karma. It's always easy as well to put our busyness, even our spiritual business, ahead of compassion and healing for people. We can be all tempted to think it's too much trouble. Somebody else can deal with it. The government can deal with it. As well, if a priest and Levite touch a potentially dead person, they'd be unclean and forbidden to serve in the temple in a potentially once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Thirdly, the bandits, the bandits were notorious for having one bandit pretend to be wounded in order to lead kind people into a trap. It just wasn't worth the risk. Be honest, how many of you would like to go alone at 1 a.m. into a dark alley near Maine and Hastings? In verse 33, Dr. Luke, the physician, again uses technical medical terminology, I won't give you the Greek, to describe binding up the traumatized wound. Dr. Luke actually records the medical use of oil and wine by the Samaritan for healing the Jericho Road victim. The ancient 5th century BC great physician Hippocrates from whom we get the Hippocratic Oath. He also advocated the medical usage of oil and wine in healing wounds. Wine is an antiseptic cleansing and preventing bacterial growth. The oil served as a covering, almost like a modern day bandage. Now, moving on to verse 37, we come to the key of the entire healing parable. 
And the answer is, who's the neighbor? The one who had mercy or compassion on him, Jesus himself, said in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The healing ministry, it must be rooted in mercy and compassion. It's not just an inner warm feeling. Compassion is very practical and concrete in nature. Kindness is compassion and mercy in action. Kindness heals. Many of you realize our modern day hospitals, they emerge out of the very Christian healing ministry that Dr. Luke was describing. Even in talking about the care by the innkeeper, he used a technical medical term for medical care. See, Dr. Luke wanted us to know that prayer and medicine belong together. There's no competition. Some Christians falsely say you have to choose between medicine and prayer. They belong together. Dr. Luke also wants us to know that healing is about loving our neighbor in practical ways. You can see that healing is costly and personal. The Good Samaritan invested his own finances in caring for the victim. And healing may even involve bringing over a casserole, like often happens at All Saints when people are sick. In conclusion, healing is still central today to the gospel of Jesus Christ. As Hebrews 3.8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The heavens are open. His healing is coming through. Jesus is here today by his Spirit waiting to heal you through medicine and prayer. Jesus, even in 2020, is still willing and able to heal the sick. In closing, I want to ask you three questions. First, how many of you need healing, either physically or emotionally, and from life's wounds? Raise your hand right now if you need healing today. Don't be hesitant. Raise your hand. Something physical or emotional or spiritual. There are online prayer teams ready to pray for you at 1230. Bishop Peter will be telling you more about this. Secondly, how many of you want to be more like the Good Samaritan in bringing healing to the wounded? How many of you want to be used in healing the sick? Raise your hand if you want to be more used. Don't be hesitant. And thirdly, how many of you in these COVID times may be feeling weary and well-doing? Maybe you're a bit exhausted. Maybe you need a fresh outpouring of neighborly compassion. Raise your hand if you want a fresh outpouring of compassion. The risen Jesus, he said twice, essentially, go and do it. Go and do it. Thank you for being here today.